very much. Blessed with amazing musical talent at our church, aren't we? Foretaste of heaven. Our church is a foretaste of heaven for me. I, I really appreciate um, the prayer time in the morning and our song services and Sabbath school time in this time. And I'm so thankful. I just want more, more people from our community to be here. Um, before I begin, I'd like to ask that you bow your heads with me and let's just pray one more time. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you that although we're sinners, that Christ came and died for each one of us and that you've given us an opportunity to be reclaimed, to become what you intended us to be. This morning, I ask that you would be with us that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide us and that the message that I share will be inspired by you and that it will be something that's practical that each one of us um, can use and um, can bring into our lives uh, this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Make sure my computer works here. Don't always use don't always use the slides, um, but this morning I think I I think I will. <clears throat> so we'll take a moment. There we go. John lived in the mid 1800s. He was a young man, um, just deciding what he was going to do with his life. Are there some folks here, kind of at that? age group maybe, praying, Lord, what do you want me to do? He was a Christian, and he felt the commission that God has given us um, to share with those around us um, the gospel. But his talents weren't as a minister. Um, they were more in the business realm. And so as he prayed, Lord, should I be a minister? Should I be a teacher? Should I be a doctor? The Lord impressed him, you know, I want you to be, I want you to be a businessman. Um, and so John thought about that and decided he would try to witness and bring Christianity into, into his business. And, you know, at the time, um, if you were going to the market or going to a store in the 1800s in the United States, it was a lot more like going to Africa or Mexico or something today. How many of you have been to a market in a third world country? How many price tags do you see when you go to the market? And not very many, right? Um, usually there's a, you know, you ask how much something costs and it's like, whoa, that's pretty expensive. And you start haggling and, and you arrive at a price and you know, the person who's selling tries to go as high as they can, and the person that is buying tries to get as low as they can. And of course, the, the old rule, the buyer beware, is, uh, is pretty important in those situations, right? So John decided he wanted to bring Christianity into his business. And you might, you might have guessed um, who this is. Uh, his name was John Wanamaker. Has anybody heard of John Wanamaker? A number of people have heard of John Wanamaker. Um, so John Wanamaker started, started his store, and he started doing things that kind of surprised all the other retailers um, in the area. His um, first that he brought in, no one before John Wanamaker had ever put a price tag on anything because, you know, you want to try to sell things as high as you can. But John Wanamaker said, no, I want to sell things at a fair price. And I want people to be able to know what that price is, and then they can make a decision on it. So John Wanamaker invented price tags, and of course now price tags are pretty much everywhere, right? And at least in, in the United States. John Wanamaker also um, put in the money back guarantee. Again, we're kind of just, you know, you buy something from Amazon, it doesn't fit. You just kind of assume you can send it back, go to the store, same thing. Before John Wanamaker, that was not a good assumption. But John Wanamaker said, I'm going to sell quality things. I'm going to sell it at a reasonable price. And 
I believe it, the right Christian thing to do is to be able to give people a money back guarantee if it doesn't live up to that quality. So John Wanamaker invented that. Um, he also invented um, employee medical care. So paying for insurance, um, taking care, and in his day, they didn't really have that insurance. So he paid for, it was kind of self-insurance for his employees, but he helped with their medical care. And then also employee retirement pensions. So that came from John Wanamaker as well. All of these things, um, John, as a Christian, brought into his business because he wanted to witness by doing business in a way that Jesus would do business, and the way he felt Jesus would do business. And so John was able to be a, a tremendous witness. Um, he has we still significant influence today. The, the department store concept um, was invented by him as well. So you know, the predecessor to pretty much every store you know, that you can think of, um, retail store that you can think of, came from John Wanamaker. And all of this um, because John wanted to be a missionary with the profession and the talents that God had given him, which were in the business realm. And so this morning, I'd like to, I'd like to share with you, um, not all of us are ministers or teachers, um, Bible workers. In fact, probably the majority of us um, have talents and are, we're all called to be missionaries, right? Every single one of us is called to be a missionary. But our profession, um, God may call us to a lot of different professions. I mean, as I look out here today, I see artists, engineers, builders, um, mothers um, who, who are called to, to, that's a profession, right? It's absolutely a profession. So God has given us all of these different professions, and he still wants us to use these professions to minister to him. And so um, my background, I would like to share this morning kind of my background um, and my my testimony um, in this in this space and some of the things that I've learned as I've uh, been studying about how to be a Christian business person because my background I'm an engineer and an entrepreneur and now a salesperson um, and work in in business but the Bible has a lot to say for those of us who are working um, as business people or in other professions and how we can still be witness, witnesses for the Lord. So I'd like to share with you this morning, first, some of the concepts um, that I've learned and that I try to practice. Um, and then second, my testimony. So what the Lord has done uh, for me and how he's worked for me. I've made a lot of mistakes. And the Lord, one thing I can tell you is the Lord wants to work with us, whatever our profession is. He wants to work with us. He will help us even when we make mistakes, and he will support us throughout um, our lives. So uh, this morning, that's what I'd like to speak about. Um, the first, first thing I'd like to cover is just some of the concepts that I've learned from the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy about how to be a Christian business person. And there's a few foundational concepts and then um, some values or principles uh, that, that we'll cover before I talk about my testimony. So the first um, foundational uh, principle when we're uh, doing business for the Lord or doing business is that the Lord owns everything. Um, this is from education, and this chapter is a wonderful chapter on this topic, by the way, um, in education. It says, that which lies at the foundation of business integrity and true success is the recognition of God's ownership. The creator of all things, he is the original proprietor. Proprietor means owner, right? We are his stewards. All that we have is a trust from him to be used according to his direction. This foundational principle changes how we look at, you know, if we start a business or if we're doing work, it really changes our whole outlook. If we're working for God versus just working for ourselves, it's a completely different concept and it's so important that that is the foundation that we, that we lay. Also foundational is that God's law is really, should be at the bottom of um, any business that we have. And even in our whole society, um, business, if you look today 
at business in the United States, and I know we've fallen a long ways, right? The United States, we're a Christian uh, country. We're not living up to that, but still, the Bible principles, there's still a lot of God's law that we can see in our, in our country and in our business system compared to, say, Russia <laughs> right now, um, where property rights aren't respected, all of the, the things of God's law are not respected there. But this is fundamental as well, God's law. Godliness is profitable unto all things. This is 1 Timothy 4.8. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. God's way of doing things is not only just best in heaven. It's best here on earth as well. A lot of times in the short term, people try to take shortcuts. You know, one person... You know, we see this in third world countries. Congo, um, I went there as a missionary a couple times, and over and over again, people have taken advantage of that country. And so one person benefits from the whole wealth of the country while the rest of the country is taken advantage of. Um, but God's way brings not just prosperity in the future world, but here as well. And this is what Mrs. White says, again, in Education 137. For all that makes confidence and cooperation possible. The world is indebted to the law of God as given in his word. The psalmist's words, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver, state that which is true from other than a religious point of view. They state an absolute truth. It's an absolute truth. Even Wall Street is dependent um, on God's law um, to, to function. They state an absolute truth and one that is recognized in the business world. God's law, God's law. Um, one more foundational truth is God calls us to bring our religion into our work. He wants us, as we're working, whatever it is, whether it's a mother that's working from home, <laughs> taking care of her children, educating, or we're a plumber, whatever it is, we should seek to bring God into, into that work. Um, again, a couple of different quotes. Whatever we do, wherever we're placed, God desires to control our minds that we may do perfect work. Christianity and business, rightly understood, are what? Not two separate things. They are one. Bible religion is to be brought into all that we do and say. So is plumbing, going out and doing that, is that working for the Lord? Is that part of religion? It is. Is real estate? If we're Christians, real estate should be part of our religion and doing it in a way that is honest and right. Um, Christian was telling me about um, he is in a partnership in his religion or in his um, real estate business, and his partner um, told one of the people that they were selling their house told her we were going to get such and such a price. And he forgot a technical detail. There was you know, some other thing that was going to deduct from that price. And so he, was, he actually told her the wrong thing. And he said, I made the mistake. I'm going to pay for that myself. And he did. So that's bringing religion into, into real estate, right? Doing the right thing. Um, by the true follower of Christ, every business transaction will be regarded as part of his religion, just as what? Prayer is part of his religion. So these are foundational principles. God is the owner. His law is what makes cooperation and business possible. And then he wants us to bring our religion into our work every day, just as much as prayer is part of our religion. So those are the foundational concepts. Here are some specific principles that um, Ellen White gives, and these mean a lot to me, and I'll explain why um, in just a minute, but there's, there's just five of them, five simple principles uh, for business. And she says, there's no branch of a legitimate business for which the Bible does not afford an essential preparation. So what's, an, what's a good essential preparation if you're going to be working in business? Bible, the Bible is a good, it's not only good, but essential preparation for um, legitimate business. There's some un illegitimate business out there too, but legitimate business, the Bible is an essential preparation. 
And then she gives us five principles. It's principles of diligence, honesty, thrift, temperance, and purity are the secret of true success. So do you want the secret of true success? It's right here, it's on the screen. Um, so I'd like, I'd like to just take a few minutes and let's look at these five principles um, in the Bible um, and maybe a couple of Spirit of Prophecy quotes. And then I wanna to talk to you about how um, these mean a lot to me um, in just a moment in my testimony. So let's look at this. Um, diligence, diligence. A couple of um, verses that we can look at there. One we read as our scripture reading this morning. Let's turn there, Colossians chapter three. And we'll read the passage in context. Colossians chapter three. And we'll read verse, uh, verses 22 and 23. It says, bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with what? I service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. What are a couple principles that you can see in this verse that apply to diligence? I'm more of a teacher than a preacher, so um, I, I like to ask for, ask for input. A couple principles that you see in this verse that apply to diligence. Do it heartily. What's that mean? Do it heartily. It's maybe a really put everything into it, right? So do it heartily. Do it, put, put your might behind it. Don't just kind of, eh. There's another related one there, similar to that. So he says, do it heartily, but he says, don't do something else. I service, I service. What's that mean? I service. Uh, Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you just kind of sweep everything under the, under the bed. Nobody can see it, but it's still there. Um, one time we were, Ron will remember this, he was helping us with some remodeling on our house. And we had a bathroom on the, it was a split level house, and we had a bathroom on the ground floor. And we assumed that the, there was a pad, you know, a pad underneath everything. And we went to change the, the floor out in the bathroom. Do you remember that, Ron? We pulled up the carpet and plywood was just like in really bad shape. So we decided we'll pull that up and it was just dirt underneath there. It looked pretty good on the outside, but it was just eye service. So don't use eye service. We want to do things well, do it right, do it heartily. And then to who? To the Lord, to the Lord. Sometimes we have tough bosses to work for. Sometimes they ask us to do things we don't really want to do. But we can remember that we're doing things as unto the Lord and not unto men. Um, and it changes. It changes how we do things. So, so diligence. Diligence is an important one. What's the, what's the next one? Honesty. Honesty. So bringing honesty um, into, into our work. One passage that again, has meant a lot to me. Um, there's been times when I've had to think about this. If you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 15, there's been times when I've promised something and it's been financially painful to, uh, to follow through on it. But um, let's turn, uh, I'm sorry, Psalms, Psalms 15, not, um, not Isaiah 15. Psalms 15, God gives us some counsel around honesty. Psalms chapter 15. I think there's a, a whitey song that goes with this passage. We'll read just the, the whole chapter. It's only in five verses. Lord, who may abide in your tab tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks 
the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his, neighbor, with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money to usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. In our business, God wants us to speak the truth from our hearts. And he wants us, if we, if we say something, we make a promise, we swear to our own hurt and change not. What does that mean? Swear to your own hurt. That's kind of old language. How would you say, how would you say that if you're putting in the current English? Swearing to your own hurt and changing not. You keep your promises even if it doesn't turn out to your benefit. Kind of like Chris's, Chris's partner who said, here's what the price is going to be. Oh, I forgot about this. But he still kept that promise. He still kept what he said. That's swearing to your own hurt and changing not. That can be really hard to do. Um, but the Lord will bless us if we are honest with him. There's another aspect of honesty, honesty to God with the money that we make, isn't there? In Malachi chapter 3, God says, you robbed me. <laughs> and they say, what have you, how have we robbed you? And how have they robbed God? Tithes and offerings. So honesty also involves our tithe and offering. We be honest with God and give him um, his portion because he owns it all, right? He's only asked us for right now to return to him um, a tenth plus an offering. And so we need to be honest, honest with him in that as well. What's the next one? Thrift, thrift. What does thrift mean? That's kind of an old, kind of an old word. Don't waste, don't waste. Yeah, don't waste, be frugal. Um, the, in Proverbs 31, it, it talks about the um, kind of the perfect wife, right? And she's, she's very frugal. You look at that. She's um, making, making things, spinning her own yarn, making clothing, all of that, being frugal, using her money well. Another aspect of this is um, found in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. This is a good concept as we, whoever we are, whether we're business people or not, good one to remember, and it is in that category of thrift, I think. Proverbs 22, verse 7. Second part of the verse is the part I'm thinking about. It says, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the servant to the lender. God hasn't, doesn't say you can't borrow, but you probably don't want to do, you probably want to minimize it as much as possible, right? <laughs> so part of, part of being thrifty is avoiding, avoiding borrowing as much as we can. Um, this, is, this is from the Spirit of Prophecy, um, and also in education. She says, let the youth be taught to take eternity into their reckoning. Let them be taught to choose the principles and seek the possessions that are enduring, to lay up for themselves a treasure in the heavens that fail not, where no thief approaches nor moth corrupteth. All who do this are making the best possible preparation for the life in this world. No man can lay up treasure in heaven without finding his life on earth, thereby enriched and ennobled. So laying up treasure in heaven is a good way for us to learn to be, learn to be thrifty. Um, we're putting aside that money, not just spending it on ourselves, but laying it up in heaven and helping other people with it. Okay, uh, number four, temperance. Temperance. What does temperance have to do with business? Hmm. Sometimes, uh, especially if you start your own business, for those of you who want to start a business, um, you have to work really hard. And sometimes you're tempted to work too hard. <laughs> Rhonda will tell you that I have this temptation. Um, and then you can get worn out and you don't do a great job. You're not thinking very well. So temperance in that. Um, so we need, to be, we need to be temperate 
in the, the work that we're doing. Also temperance um, in the way we eat, getting exercise, all of those things apply to business as well. Um, Mrs. White says that we should, if we're in business, we won't be successful unless we have unless we have set times to get up, to go to bed, and to eat our meals. So temperance in the way that we kind of manage our day and the things that we eat and the times, all of those things are important. Last one. What's the last one? Purity. We don't think about purity so much in business today. And that's a it's a bummer <laughs> because it it really often um, we'll see a CEO that's made it all the way to the pinnacle and the next day he gets laid off because he fails in this er arena, right? Um, I think also the, the third commandment, taking God's name in vain, um, we see a lot of that today too. And I think this applies, seventh commandment, so adultery. Um, and then of course, the eighth commandment, stealing, uh, as part of purity too, we avoid, avoid that as well. So keeping the third commandment, the seventh commandment, the eighth commandment, I think are all incorporated um, under, under number, number five. So I'd like to tell you just a little bit about me and my background and my story as it comes to kind of my career. So Rhonda and I moved, uh, after we graduated from college, we moved to Washington. Ron and Gwen were already here and they just, they lived in Rice. At the time, they moved out. We were in Kansas, and both of Rhonda and I graduated as engineers. And uh, we moved out to Seattle, and that was a place that I could get a job as an engineer. So we were working. And after a couple of years, we started talking and said, you know, it would, we'd like to start our own business. We'd like to work um, on things I was finding that it was very stressful. The work that I was in was pretty stressful. And it was also, some of these things were hard to keep in the business that I was working in. There was, there was some elements here where I felt very uncomfortable. Um, honesty was one of them. Um, uh, the business I was working in, often we would, uh, they would sell something to a customer and they would say, you know, we're gonna do this for you, we're gonna make it all work. And then we wouldn't do a great job of making it work. We're in technology business and we'd sell the tech, drop it off at their, loading dock, and then wouldn't do a great job of actually implementing it and making it work. It was really frustrating uh, to me. And then uh, other elements here too, um, and then the temperance and purity and thrift. And <laughs> so we talked and Rhonda was very encouraging and said, I, I'll definitely support you. Um, let's, let's start our own business. And so a little bit scary and we just had a new baby. And the week I chose, so I quit my job that I'm quitting, I'm just gonna start. And the week that I chose to start was the week of September 11, 2001. <laughs> and my very first client was the Gate, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I was there in the morning and saw the planes crash into the towers. And it was just a very uncertain and kind of scary time. And so we did a lot of praying, Lord, give us wisdom, help us to do a good job, help us to bring our religion into our work. And so the Lord blessed. I uh, was just an individual consultant in my space for a number of years, consulting and helping different companies. And it just kind of grew and grew and grew each year. And we talked about, I, I think every business, and our pastors actually brought this up for our church, every business should have a mission and values. You know, what are we trying to do and what are our values? And so as I read the previous quote, um, here, I thought, what better values for a business than to make your values these five, right? So my company was called North Point Consulting, and this was um, our, our mission. So we aspire to be the leading provider of data networking, unified communications, and network security expertise in the Pacific Northwest, always doing the right thing for our customers. So that was our, that was our mission statement. Um, and then our values, probably recognize. So diligence, and then we, there's some specifics. So, and as we hired more employees, we made this very much, um, Chris can actually testify to this. He worked for me for a number of years. Every week we would review our values and we'd talk about, we'd celebrate different employees who 
had exemplified our values during that week. Um, and so diligence, honesty, and candor um, were one of our values. And you can see some of the Bible concepts here too. We communicate with each other openly. We keep our promises to our customer, even if it hurts us financially. That's swearing to your own hurt and changing not. Um, we give our customers good fair deal. So you can see some of the, some of the details of our values. Um, I tweaked some of the English so that my employees could better understand um, these things. So rather than purity, I, we use principle. So we treat our customers the way we want to be treated. Our relations with our customers are professional. We, don't, we do not do things that would call our ethics into question. Um, so helping, helping my employees to kind of understand things in current, current English. Professional growth, this was a little bit of a, an extra one, but also fit into, um, into the temperance uh, category. Work-life balance also fit into that, uh, that temperance category as well. And then thrift. Um, which is direct, directly translated over. And so um, we st started to grow, grow the business. Um, I was blessed to have a very, my first employee was just a fantastic employee. He is actually from Sweden. He worked for me for over 10 years um, and just consummate professional, um, really, really good employee. And then we just continued to, to add, from our, add to our team. Um, Chris worked for me, a number of other Seventh-day Adventists worked for me as well, but a number of our uh, employees were not Seventh-day Adventists. Um, but all of them um, came to us and, and specifically said, we really appreciate these values. And there were, a lot, there were opportunities to witness um, because of our values. And a number of our folks were, were family people, so they, they all appreciated um, these things from their, from their family's perspective. We also kept up the Sabbath. So the entire company, um, we kept the Sabbath. We stopped working um, on Friday afternoon and we didn't work um, throughout the Sabbath hours. And it, with, within a couple, you know, a couple years, I discovered it's actually probably really important to put this into our contracts. So, so we actually had in our contracts, you know, we don't work from Friday sundown till Saturday after sundown. And, um, and every customer that signed a contract, that was part of the contract. And so that gives you lots of opportunities to talk about the Sabbath. Um, uh, pretty much every contract negotiation, people are like, well, what is this? Why, is, why does that? And so um, I had the opportunity to talk to many customers about that. And also every single employee that we brought into the company, we discussed this right up front. We keep uh, the Sabbath. And my, my manager who worked for me, who was not a Seventh-day Adventist, got to the point where he could tell all about the Sabbath and tell a new hire that was coming in. We keep, and he's like, it's actually really good. You never get called during this time. Um, you can just be, you know, just take the time off. And it really, it's a, it's a Sabbath. It's a nice break. Um, our, we never had keeping the Sabbath, even though to, in our business, frequently a lot of the work needed to be done after hours. You know, we're working on networks and security systems and things that you, you don't want to go down. And so often um, customers would want us to do work on the Sabbath. And so um, it, you know, when you go into a business like this, you might think uh, that could be a real problem, right? That we might have customers who would say, no, we're not going to work with you because you don't work on Saturday. But it, it, never, it never actually was a problem. We never lost business because of it. We did one time, um, we had a healthcare customer. Chris was just reminding me of this yesterday. We were talking, we had a healthcare customer, um, hospital system, and we were working on um, their communications system throughout the hospital. It was a pretty big deal, um, uh, large six figure uh, engagement. And they came back to us and said, uh, we really need a company who can work 24 by seven. So we're gonna go with somebody else. That's a bummer. <laughs> but I prayed about it, um, told the team, we'll be fine. Um, and within, I think it was about two or three months, Chris might remind me, they called us back. They said, well, we worked with this other vendor, but they're so unreliable and the job that they've done is so poor. We'll work with you even with the Sabbath, it's fine, it's okay. Uh, 
And so, um, so even that one where it really felt like we were going to lose a significant amount of business, um, the, Lord, the Lord worked it out um, and it was still, it was a blessing. Um, God blessed our business. We grew to about 30 employees. Um, we had you know, significant growth. We also were able to work with just a lot of, well, I think I took it, oh, these are just quotes, sorry. Um, quotes from different um, customers that we worked with. So we were Warehousers Vendor of the Year in 2015, and um, we worked at the Seahawks. And these are all different customers in the Northwest that we worked with. So Costco and Nike and REI, and so all, lots, of, lots of kind of name brand customers um, that we helped um, along the way. Um, so it was very challenging, um, often stressful, when you have 30 people working for you and 30 families that you're providing for um, can be a little bit nerve wracking. But um, in 2015, 2016, uh, the, the technology world started, started changing and there was a shift from companies kind of providing their own technology work, which but that's what we worked with helping them to shifting that to the cloud. And so I was praying, um, about what should we do next? How, you know, we're kind of at this point where the world is changing and we need to change with it. And I don't know if I made the right choice. Um, we had four different companies that approached us that in 2016 that said, you know, we'd like to buy you. We'd like to buy your company um, and, you know, incorporate you into, into our company. Um, I chose a company who was actually a customer of ours and had been a customer for a number of years. I felt like I knew them really well. Um, and I felt like their managed services that they provided were very complimentary. And we, we agreed to be purchased um, by them. Almost from the beginning, it was challenging. And I learned a lot about trying to merge a business that is run kind of God's way with a business that is not. Um, and the values and the culture of the two companies didn't mesh well. Um, our first year with, with them, uh, we did really well. I mean, financially, uh, we grew and continued to add employees. And, but their side of the bargain, they were, we were supposed to provide professional services. They were supposed to provide managed services. And their managed services, we found out as we started to bring them into our customers, were terrible. <laughs> It was really bad. Um, so we were providing, you know, premium service and they were not providing premium service and our customers were frustrated. Um, ultimately, I asked them, well, can we just can we just rebuild this service and do it our way? And um, we asked that the first year. No, that would be too expensive. We asked it the second year and finally they agreed and they said, yes, do it your way. Um, and let's, so we, we got the funding to do that and we started to grow and we started to hire and we started to build out this service. In the meantime, the company that bought us was bought by another company. <laughs> um, so it was GCI, billion dollar company, was bought by a multi-billion dollar company, Liberty. And Liberty in the background started kind of doing their, their stuff. And they, as we were building out that managed service, they came back and said, ah, we would prefer the GCI just go back to doing what it was doing before. Um, they were making all these investments. Um, and at this point, I was a vice president over our original North Point business, plus a business in Colorado, and they were expanding into Texas. And so we, we had all of that going. And Liberty came back and said, ah, we want to we want to stop the, the managed service and we want to cut back. And so that was extremely painful. <laughs> um, we, I was told I needed to lay off, you know, the whole team in Colorado and a bunch of our team, including a whole bunch of people we just hired, but also um, our, a, a number of employees who had worked for us for a long time. Um, so starting at nine o'clock in the morning, one morning until four o'clock with no breaks, no lunch, nothing, just, I just had one person after another come into my office and was laying people off throughout the day. Um, it was one of the worst days of my life. And I know it was an even worse day for the employees that I was laying off. And I felt just like I had betrayed 
betrayed um, my employees. It was really, really bad. Um, and so I was, I was still continuing to pray. We, they hadn't shut down the whole business yet, but Liberty then came back and said, yeah, we just wanna, we just wanna cut all the investments that GCI has made in the last few years. So it wasn't just our business, it was a bunch of other things. And so the day that news came, um, I, just, I just went outside and went for a walk. I was just praying, Lord, everything, you know, all the customers that we've built up, all the employees that I've worked with and been friends with, um, all of that is now just, and I don't have a choice. I, I, can't, I can't change this. And I was praying and my phone rang, um, but just walking. So I was walking outside the business uh, office and my phone rang and it was, um, you know, you network in business. And it was a, a friend who I had worked some with their company, um, they're from Portland. And he is also a Christian, um, but we just kind of stayed in touch. Um, so he was an exec, he's the CEO of this company. And he, he just called me and he was like, hey, just wanted to check in, see how things are going. And I said, well, <laughs> not so good. Um, things are not going well at all. And so I told him what was happening. He said, well, I'd like to talk with you. I'll, I'll fly to Seattle. Can I meet you tomorrow? Um, and so he flew up. Uh, with his general manager, and they said, you know, we would, we know your reputation, we know the, the quality of the people that you have, we would like to just, you know, everyone who's left, we'd like to bring them all over to our company. Um, and so I went back to our employees, and at this point, all of our employees were very professional, um, most of them, you know, very well respected. Um, they all could just go get their own jobs at a different, you know, at a different company. But we talked as a team and we said, do we want to stay together or do we just want to part and go our, our ways? And the whole team that was still remaining, I mean, we'd had to lay off a number of folks, but the whole team that was there said, we want to stay together. We'd like to just keep the team together. So um, GCI Liberty, did, a, did the second round of layoffs, and I was the first to get laid off in that, in that next one. So they laid, laid me off, and we had two weeks then um, between that time and when everyone else would be completely laid off. So they kind of staggered it. And in the meantime, they just decided to walk away from everything. They cut off all customer contracts. We had projects that were in the middle. So you've got all these things that are just happening, and they're just, they just cut it all. So just walk away. And so we, as a team, we came together, we met kind of offline, and we all agreed, yes, let's join, join this new company. Um, the cool thing about the new company was it was, they're working with all the new technology, um, and it was, a, it was a neat opportunity. The bad thing for them, and I was up front with them, is, look, you're getting all of our employees but you're not getting any customer contracts, right? All of these contracts have been canceled. And for those of you who aren't familiar, getting a customer contract through and signed can take months. Um, I'm working with Costco right now and we're changing the contract and we're at month 13 on waiting on getting the contract signed. So just because you have all these employees, the work that we've been doing, it, you know, how do you get the contracts? So it's like, it's like starting a business over you know, in two weeks. And so they said, we still wanna do it, we have, you know, and, and he's a Christian. So he's like, I have faith. This is, you know, this is, a, this is the right thing to do. And we, we believe that your customers will, will understand that too. So um, my, uh, I, I started going out to the customers and visiting with them and just explaining what was happening and going on. And one after another, the customer said, we want to support, we're really, we, you know, you've done great service over the last 16 years. We really want to support. Alaska Airlines specifically said, we'll give you, you know, it was like $500,000 in business right now just to support, you know, to support the team um, so that you have business immediately to keep, keep things going. And so they just, we'll, we'll sign our MSA over, we'll do it right now, and we'll give, here's $500,000 to keep working. 
It's just, I mean, amazing. Um, and that happened one after another after another. We lost one customer through that, through that experience. Um, and so the Lord helped us put that, put the business back together again. Um, and it wasn't perfect. I mean, there were still a number of folks who had been laid off that, um, that were not reincorporated into the business. But the Lord blessed. Our employees came over. They were in a really good situation. And they're still, most of them are still in the, in the same company um, in, a, in a good situation. We took care of our customers. Um, and then the Lord has blessed me as I've continued to uh, continue to work. Um, I've, I've shifted. So I've gone from being a president to a vice president to a sales guy <laughs> now, um, which, is, which is just fine. That's, I, I actually asked, you know, I've been through a lot of different acquisitions now. I kind of like to do something more individual contributor. But um, we, through, through all of this experience, um, I learned to really treasure several specific promises that God has given to us. Um, first one here, Romans 8, uh, 28, all things work together for, for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I don't know that all the decisions that I made were the right decisions, um, but I do know God has supported and helped when I've gone to him, and this next quote, this is um, just a precious quote, whatever your anxieties and trials is from Desire of Ages, spread out your case before the Lord. So when company comes to you and says, we're gonna lay everyone off, spread out your case before the Lord, your spirit will be braced for endurance. This next part is especially precious to me. The way will be open for you, sorry, you, not your, you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. And it goes on to say, the heavier your burdens, the more blessed it is to have God carry those burdens for you. God can help you, he can take it, he can disentangle you from all of these things, and he can, he can save you. Um, this, put your talents into the work. Ask God for wisdom, and it shall be given you. And then finally, thus our business or calling is part of God's great plan. God has a plan for each one of you, and especially young people, God has a plan for you. Pray that the Lord will show you what his will is, because if you do, if you're following his will, our business or calling is part of God's great plan. And so long as it's conducted according to his will, he himself is responsible for the results. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We don't, she goes on to say, we don't have to worry. We don't have to um, be stressed because he's the original proprietor. He's the one who owns these things. And if we do things according to his will, he himself is responsible for the results. And so this morning, I just, I like to encourage you, whatever God's, um, God has called you to do, whatever talents he's given to you, give those talents to him. Follow his will. It will be the best thing for this life. I promise you. And it will be the best thing for the next life. It'll be a blessing to other people. It'll be a blessing to this world. It will give you value. You'll be doing something more than just making money, or finding pleasure, you'll be doing something that brings value and helps other people. And so put your talents into the work. Ask God for wisdom, and it shall be given. So that's, that's my testimony this morning. Um, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. He keeps his promises, and he'll, he'll keep his promises for you too. So let's bow our heads and, uh, and pray. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning. We thank you that you are a loving, merciful God. You've given us all this counsel and this wisdom, and that we don't have to rely on ourselves, that you want to show us what your will is for our lives. I pray this morning in a special way for the young people here. We're nearing the time of Jesus' return, and you have a plan for each one of them, each one of us. Pray, Lord, that you would show that to them, 
and that we'd be willing to follow your way because we know it's the best. And in my own life, I can testify that your ways are the best ways. Your ways are the way of happiness. Your ways are the ways of success. Father, we bring all the glory to you, and we ask that you would work in us to will and to do according to your good pleasure. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.